who's James Cameron. James, you're our host, really. So thank you very much for having us here this morning. I noticed, by the way, that there is breakfast waiting for us, so the sooner we stop talking, the sooner we can chat. So um, let's keep going. But, but James, there's been, um, it seems to me that Alex has, has pointed out the issues about the knowledge economy. It's so important. You're the chair of ODI. This is what ODI does. Um, so this, this plays to, to your leadership role there. Um, and Mr. Kawai talked about the huge market potentials for green growth, and you, you lead um, and co-founded Climate Change Capital and are very interested in the, the market-based instruments. So mm. I'm sure you've got lots to, to comment on on, on these, pa these presentations. Of course, as ever. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, welcome <laughs> to the ODI. We had a good conversation earlier about what uh, what the ODI can do to be a host for these kinds of discussions, and very pleasing to have it. Um, broadcast to the world as well, where I hope people will feel comfortable coming here to bring their ideas, and uh, the audience here is just part of the audience out there that we hope to be able to connect to. Uh, and yes, I do see a huge role for uh, public education, discussion of complex ideas, trade-offs between economy and environment, playing a part in, in actually how you find the pathways to, to growth in economies that are increasingly going to have to be more resource efficient in order to be competitive. So we'd love to play a part uh, in that story. And yes, also uh, through Climate Change Capital, we've got some experience now over nearly 10 years um, of investing in mostly projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions driven by a price for carbon, um, but also understanding where value lies uh, in, in, in the development, particularly of energy responses um, to climate change uh, and the bulk of our investment happens to be in Asia, um, principally China but also uh, throughout Southeast Asia and Central Asia in places like uh, um, Kazakhstan and, um, and the like. So my observations come really from both those perspectives, thank you Sam, from, from the, the, the knowledge and information and data mm -hmm. side of the uh, development question and from the investment side. and, and the first point I'd like to make is that there is something in the nature of distributed power that distributes power. <coughs> if you build um, a, an energy system that enables many, many contributors to the power system and allows power to be generated close to where it is used, you are building a system that favours the poor, that favours the disenfranchised that enables power relations to alter. If you're in a rural community, take you know, the far west of China, and you currently do not have access to the grid, you are disempowered in every sense of the word, and you are dependent upon somebody else bringing it to you, somebody who already has power in both the political, economic, and you know, factual sense. If you can generate power from your own waste materials in the agricultural economy, or you can put solar PV on the roof of your community, um, and you are therefore independently powered and you can build the capacity to grow your local economy, you've not only done something practical to resolve your domestic issues, uh, but you've also increased your political power base. And I think that's universally true. Uh, Harish Handy, the great uh, solar developer in India, always says that you know, solar power might be expensive for the rich, but it's cheap for the really poor. And that's because if you don't have power, access to power is magical, it's transformative. So I think a lot of our discussions about the cost of renewables, the expense associated with building a different system, are, are based on a false assumption that it is expensive for the poor. Um, it's not. Transformations are always costly, they're not cost-free. And the idea of green growth is not without transformation costs. But we are making a very big mistake if we think the poor are somehow disadvantaged from that transformation. They are not. The really poor benefit massively from a different energy system to which they can have access. So I haven't read Stefan's piece, but I'd like to give him a really good comeback on that point. That uh, it can't be in the long-term interest of the poor to have an environment which is highly polluted, where the most marginal are most at risk from the consequences of climate change. So in the long term, coal versus renewables is a, a, a choice that does not favor 
the poor. But the poor don't have the luxury of long-term thinking. So you have to think about what matters to them right now and access to power that they, in a system that they can contribute to, particularly through the generation of their own, uh, their own power on a rooftop or through <coughs> waste. That's something that um, is worth investing in. A second point is that as these economies continue to grow and build more and more infrastructure, there's a way of building infrastructure that is both climate resilient, and that requires a particular type of investment, it requires change of practices and new ways of thinking about what to build and where, <coughs> not least because of the threat of sea level rise or increased storm activity at the coastal zone, but also just, just the way in which we organize our infrastructure so that it can um, provide uh, for uh, communities that are going to have to constantly adjust to uh, the climate change phenomenon. Um, that's, just, that's just a new way of thinking. But equally, every infrastructure decision that gets made in the growth economies of the, in the years ahead is going to have to think hard about how we make better use of resources. Uh, what, what kind of infrastructure do we need for a knowledge economy? Well, the Koreans have made a very, very good start at that by dramatically increasing the um, accessibility to broadband, for example. That's a device, that's an infrastructural device that will help us better organize our response to a wide range of environmental problems. And I'll, I'll come back to that because I think data is going to be critically important. So this is one, an area where I don't think I need a green label. I don't even need to call it green growth. I just think intelligent development in a world where there are going to be severe contest over resources and where there's a premium associated with being resource efficient, I think it needs a green label to it. It's just the way one does infrastructure given proper understanding of the uh, key facts around uh, development, both risk and opportunity associated with climate change and resource efficiency. And that's a, a link to perhaps Alex's point as well on, on green jobs. I've never favoured making arguments about green jobs. Uh, I'm just interested in whether people are fully employed and engaged and connected to the, the economy and contributing in ways that uh, come from being productive. It doesn't need a green label. Um, as it happens, a more resource efficient economy is likely to be able to develop more capacity to employ people. This is, this is, a, this is a, 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 an argument born out of the experience of increased productivity in labor markets. You build capacity to be able to engage more people in delivering output from an economy if you use resources more efficiently. Um, put another way, just think if, you, if you're able to build an energy infrastructure that is less dependent upon imported fossil fuels, where the operating cost of the infrastructure is relatively low, as it would be with any largely renewables-based system, or one where the waste economy and the energy economy are nicely integrated. If you do that, you clearly have more capital available to spend on other public goods. That, that, that's, if, that, that's true if you are spending public money, but equally true if, you're, if you've got private capital to invest. You know, it's a truism. If you've got low operating costs, you've taken a lot of risk out of your supply chain, you've also got more available in your day-to-day -day expenditure to put, to put into other uh, <coughs> things that you value in your economy. Now, that transformation is expensive. Almost all of the items in that list of expenditure have high capital costs. Uh, building a different energy infrastructure is a capital cost. But we've learned how to do that with other technologies, not least with telephony and mobile phones. So mm -hmm. It's not impossible. The next point is in, is in key s sectors in the, uh, in the Asian economy, like agriculture, um, where uh, there are, there's an absolute necessity to improve productivity and yields, where energy, water, and food security are already connected in theory, but need to be done more in, in practice. There, there's an opportunity, again, to take agricultural commodities where there is a significant growth uh, in global demand and find ways of producing uh, more food with uh, less land, uh, less requirement to draw upon scarce water resources. And again, I just want to keep emphasizing the where, where the waste energy economy can be combined. And my final point really uh, is, uh, is on data and information itself. 
I think we have huge capacity in uh, the knowledge networks, the uh, uh, data networks we have built up, the capacity to build open data networks to enable many, many more participants in the problem-solving efforts associated with environmental uh, challenges to uh, engage uh, a, a much wider range of solutions, less dependent upon a few powerful actors, whether they be governments or large corporations uh, or international uh, development banks. And we don't quite know where this is going. Uh, at the World Economic Forum, we've been looking very closely at how uh, the sustainability agenda can be advanced through open data systems. Most of the development banks are experimenting themselves on how they gather data more effectively from crowdsourcing, for example. But it's, it's really what, what could we do if we concentrated very hard on building these open data <coughs> platforms to provide the material for a more organic growth in economies based upon just higher quality understanding of the values that are at risk of the uh, resources that could be better made use of if we were to engage more and more people in the problem-solving effort. It's really about shifting odds, right? the highly complex interrelated problems where more information, greater knowledge and greater awareness is going to provide uh, increased power and opportunity uh, for uh, economic development based on a different paradigm. Uh, in, in closing, I grew up in Singapore, and I think a lot of my awareness of consciousness about environment issues was formed in that phase where Singapore's development was fixed in large part on the connection between solving public health problems mm. and enabling uh, a knowledge economy to grow. Lee Kuan Yew had many attributes, mostly good, not all, but one of the things he really understood is that in, a, in an economy of that size, you had to build an intelligent population in a place that they could thrive in. So he constantly looked at the physical environment as well as the sort of educational environment for the population, constantly uh, building the idea of a garden city, uh, dealing with public health issues in an attractive way. And I, I think, in many respects, Singapore does offer, perhaps not at a macro, you know, not the whole country, but certainly for city development in Asia, um, a lot of very good examples. and. Um, I'm actually very optimistic about the capacity of Asia to provide a more attractive model for economic <laughs> development that is resource efficient. And if we have to give it a green label, that's terrific. But in many instances, I don't think we need to. Well, James, thank you very much indeed. That's um, a good optimistic note to end on. And we, we, we haven't really mentioned the word green growth very much so far this morning. But I'm going to turn to someone who works for an organization with that label.